people in in the faith community tend to look at mental health like we're still in the days of Freud and Jung and Thomas Shaz is a, is a very popular person that has quoted that mental health isn't a real thing, okay? So they're really behind the times. But this statement right here, or this fact, this isn't something I made up, this isn't even something I found, this is something that's been found over and over again, it's a fact. They're coming here first. The fact that we're standing in a church in Tyler, Texas, and there's 800 people here, shows you there's a problem with the system, okay? And it shows you people are willing to go anywhere to get the care that they desperately need. And I would say, let's not miss what's going on here, and this is a divine opportunity, okay? If God, you know, any pastor that I would talk to, if I said, I tell you what, I got a ministry for you, and you never have to leave the chair that you're sitting in in your office, God's gonna send all the people right to you. You never have to go anywhere else. Just, you don't have to talk to the missions board, you don't have to, hire a new pastor to go out and do outreach, he's gonna send them right to your office. They jump at that. But as a, as a group of individuals in faith, we've completely ignored this, okay? And I'll show you some of that as we go through. In fact, not only have we just ignored it, but to some extent, we've actually damaged people with mental health problems even more. And so this is some data that actually Ed did about a, a couple year or two ago, and this is from the Lifeway research. Uh, and and I, you know, I have my own research where we've looked at this, and I'll kind of add into that, but this is a really nice sample. What happens when these people show up at church? Because that's the real question. They're going there, I know they are. So what are they told, and what's done for them, okay? And I think this really kind of shows you really what happens. And this is a nice study that was done. We have a, in blue, we have a group of people that refer to themselves as evangelical or fundamental Christians. What, you know, you might just kind of clump that all together as conservative Christians or orthodox Christians, if you want to think about it that way. And then you have other Americans, okay? And so, let's at this question. With Bible study and prayer alone, people with serious mental illness, like depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, can overcome mental illness. 48% of my people and your people probably said that was true. I don't believe that's true. But if I have a mental health problem, I have a serious mental illness, and that's what I'm talking about today, a serious mental illness, okay? If I have a serious mental health problem and I show up at a church and somebody tells me that right there, am I gonna get any better? In fact, what am I gonna do? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invest myself in the scriptures and I'm gonna invest myself in the kind of spiritual disciplines, because somebody that I went to for help just told me that that's what I need to get me out of that. And you know what I'm gonna find? I'm gonna find frustration, I'm gonna find failure, and I'm gonna find a God that does not care for me enough to heal me, and I'm gonna separate myself from that faith community, and I'm gonna be worse than I was when I went. Now, I don't think that's why God is sending hurting people to the church. I don't think that's how Jesus interacted with people and I, you know, but that's exactly what's happening out there. We find that 30% of interactions with mentally ill Christians with the church are negative. And in most instances, what they're told is that their mental illness does not exist. And it's one of three things, personal sin, lack of faith, or the demonic. Okay, so you show up, you got a problem. Hey, pastor, I've got a problem. Can you help me with that? What's your problem? Oh, I'm really deprived of depression, da, 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 da. Oh, well, that's just the demonic. Man, that's a good, that's a good Thursday. Now, I believe in the demonic. Don't, I'm not the, you know, I know you, you know, oh, that liberal psychology guy up there. I believe in the demonic, okay? But when someone comes to me and says they have cancer, I feel sorrow. I feel, well, I want to give them comfort. I want to give them care. If someone comes to me and says they have schizophrenia and I'm in the church, do I feel the same thing? Or do I want to fix them spiritually? Okay, whenever we want to fix anybody, we messed up, okay? Comfort and care is what we should think of first. Here's another statistic, and I was telling Ed last night, this is the one I actually like better, okay? Because this is a question, and I think a lot of people, when, when I saw this all written up, they really missed this one. They didn't push this enough. Because if you ask people, if I had a mental health issue, I believe most churches would welcome me. The, the conservative Christians said, only 21% of conservative Christians said that they disagreed with that. Because they all thought, oh, heck yeah, the church will absolutely accept you. But look what the other people said. 55% of them said, no, that's not true. They're not going to accept me. And they got it right. Because that's what my own research shows. 
shunned, shamed, stigmatized. That's what the church does to people who have mental health problems. And if you do that to the person with mental health problems, you do that to the family also. Because mental health problems don't just affect the individual, they affect everyone that they have relationships with, okay? Now, having said all this wonderful stuff and really lifted you up now, <laughs> what I wanna tell you is this, the church is the answer to our mental health crisis in this world, not just this country. And I'm gonna show you why that is. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying that just from a spiritual perspective. I'm saying that from a supportive care, mental health, physical illness perspective. And I'm gonna show you how that is. And for some reason, we just walked away from all this, when in the past, historically, the church was the leader in mental health care. So let's talk about serious mental illness. So what I'm talking about is I'm talking about that 6% that Dan mentioned, okay? 6% of the general population has serious mental illness. So I'm stripping out the substance use and things like that. And I always, you know, I always think it's interesting we use the term serious mental illness, like the other ones are, you know, what do I call those? The less serious mental illnesses? I mean, that, you know, so, and I guess that's what you would call them, but serious mental illness. So we're talking about 6% of the population uh, is struggling with that, okay? But if we look at groups, or we might even think about it as uh, pro societal problems that the church is involved with already, and we look at serious mental illness and within those groups, we find really frightening statistics. Jail inmates, and I'm not talking about prison inmates, I'm talking about at the county jail here in Thailand, okay? Because that's, those are our new psychiatric facilities. I don't know if you knew that. Largest psychiatric facility in the country. You know what it is? Harris, Harris County Jail. And I, and I didn't make that up. I actually can show you articles that say that. Okay, like scientific articles. So, Harris County Jail, okay? Jail inmates, 16% of jail inmates have a serious mental illness. That doesn't include addiction. If I added in addiction and the less serious mental illnesses, it'd be up to 68%. Okay, 16%, go into any jail in America and tell the sheriff, I can get 16% of these people out of here for you. He or she will thank you, okay? Homelessness, big problem, right? Church deals with that, right? 34%, or 20, sorry, 26% of the homeless, serious mental illness. Tell somebody that you can deal with 26% of the homeless in their area, they'll think it's a miracle. Substance abuse, okay? 34% of substance abusers have a serious mental illness. They're abusing substances as a result of their serious mental illness. Treat their serious mental illness and you have a chance of getting rid of their substance use. Uh, these are all problems that the church deals with already. Every church in America today has an addiction program, okay? Human trafficking, it's the hot thing in the church now, okay? Everybody wants to get involved. A generation ago, you couldn't have got somebody to walk into a strip club or talk to a prostitute. Okay, human trafficking, there's tons of ministries. Almost none of them have anything to do with mental health. But 68% of the study that came out last year, 68% of individuals coming out of human trafficking meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. You take that girl, which most of these ministries go in and they rescue the girl and then they put them back where they came from, you know, near their home. Guess where those girls end up in just about three months? Back where they were. They're traumatized. There was a reason, a lot of times it's mental health related, that they ended up going into that. And now they've been so traumatized and devalued that it drives them right back into it, okay? With no mental health intervention, you, you might rescue them for a while, but you haven't, have you really helped them that much? They carry that trauma with it. All of these issues, serious mental illness, all of them societal ills. You know, I'm still waiting for the mental health president. I haven't, I've had, we've had education president, you know, and things like that. We've never had the mental, because who wants to be the mental health president? I mean, nobody, that, but education, criminal justice. I mean, you just go down the list. You take, you cut out the mental health aspect of that, and you've made a dramatic input, uh, increase in societal uh, suffering, you reduced it, and you, you saved enormous amounts of money for the country. So I'm not just talking about, as Dan said, I'm not just talking about something we made up here in the US for weak people, okay? 450 million people in the world, this is World Health Organization data, suffer from mental health problem. That would be the third largest country in the world, okay? So again, if you wanna look at this from a missional perspective, because I do believe it is the great mission field, 
of the 21st century for the church, and we're missing it. If I told a pastor today, I got the third largest country in the world lined up for you, and God's already going to send them to your door. I mean, they're in a Southern Baptist in the world that wouldn't jump at that, okay? I mean, that's ex I mean, I do a lot of work at Southern Baptist Convention. They love that. That would be awesome, right? A million people a year commit suicide. 90% plus will suffer from a mental health problem at the time they commit suicide. That's a million people. One in four families in the world is de dealing with a mentally ill loved one. It's the same thing in the U.S. It's one in four families, but worldwide it's the same thing. So it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, you can be in the sedan and you're going to deal with mental health problems. So if you're a missionary and you go out, you're going to be dealing with these issues. The American Bible Society, which is tr predominantly Bible translators, they translate uh, the Bible into native languages. You know, these are the people that will... They'll literally live with a group their entire life to translate the Bible. Trauma, the, the psychiatric ramifications of trauma are such a barrier to people receiving the scriptures. They actually started, and you've probably never heard of this, they started a trauma institute as part of the American Bible Society. They send people into Africa and different parts of the world to train pastors how to deal with people who've been traumatized because what they found was people that are traumatized are so debilitated, they cannot receive the gospel. They cannot receive the scriptures. You spend your entire life translating the scriptures into their language. You then give them the scriptures, and they're so traumatized by what's been going on around them. Systematic rape, war, famine, disease. They, they can't receive it. So the American Bible Society started a, a mental health trauma section. I mean, it's a missional thing. What led, uh, you know, a guy brought up as a Lutheran in Pearland, Texas, and a shout out to my Lutheran brothers out there. Okay, not Lutheran anymore, but, well, I guess I'm always Lutheran, right? So, but the Libya, Libya. I got off an airplane in Libya while they were still fighting a revolution with no visa, okay? The, I went there with a relief team. All I had was, a, was a, a shirt that had our, like, logo on it and a little, like, lanyard that thing that we made up ourselves, okay? So that was weird enough. But then when we got there and we said, hey, we're a Christian relief organization and we're here to help you. What can we do to help you? They're fighting a revolution. There are people living in squalor in the city that we're in. And you know what they said? Mental health problems. You've got to help us with mental health. And that ultimately took me and my friend Joe to Libya multiple times over the next two years to help train what they call mental health care providers and to set up trauma groups Systematic rape, torture, combat, famine. All those things have been going on for 40 years. That population is completely traumatized. They have so many mental health problems and they have no functioning mental health care system. And that's the first thing they said. Can you help us with mental health issues? This is worldwide. This isn't just something we make up over here. Now, would, would the church like to go to Libya? Heck yeah. Was I talking about God in Libya and, and his role in in healing people in the context of mental health problems? Absolutely. I did the same talk in Libya that I do in the U.S. I just kind of more god at it than I jesus did. it. But it was the same, the same truths of the scripture. And they, just re and they received it and they loved it. And we talked about prayer and the things that Dan just talked about. I mean, they, they're very receptive to that. You know, we prayed with people. We, we helped equip people to deal with mental health problems. We trained mental health care providers. We set up trauma groups. I mean, they were, they were happy to have us there. But it opens, it's a whole mission field that we've just completely ignored. Now, let's put this in a scriptural context. Because what I'm telling you right now is people are going to the church when they're in this distress. And then they're getting told some pretty ugly things. And a lot of times that's very hurtful to them. Okay, and, and damages them even more. And our data shows a lot of those people actually leave the faith because of that. So now you might ask yourself, well, I mean, how do I look in the scriptures? As people of faith, we'd like to look in the scriptures, but to say, well, what does the scripture say about that? Okay. And I would say that there is a story in the scripture that is a perfect example of the, the stigma and shame that's associated with mental illness. But it's just, it's been a physical illness context. Because in the first century, if you had a physical illness, you know, within that kind of Jewish theology, you had a physical illness, you're being, you're being punished by God. Okay. I mean, you're, you're the unrighteous. You did something Somebody did something. This is a punishment. You're, you're not the kind of people we want to hang out with. And we see that all throughout the life of Jesus as he deals with the Pharisees. But this wonderful story 
in John 9, of the man born blind, is really, in, in my opinion, the story that, that really the scriptures have for us that tells us how are we supposed to interact with people, how are we supposed to deal with people as a, the church, the body of Christ, that are struggling with these things. And so we see the disciples at their finest in this story, okay? They're walking along with Jesus, you know, probably arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And then they, you know, it says Jesus saw the man. It says he saw the man. So the guy's out begging out in front of, because that's what you do in the first century when you are a, oh, that's not the first century, is it? That's now. So that's a picture from Mexico, actually. There's a literal blind beggar right there. And so we still kind of do this today a little bit. And so he sees the man, and I imagine he immediately started to move towards the man because that's what he would do. That's what he always did. That's what he wants us to do. And what, do, you know, I, I always say that the gospel writer kind of left out a verse because it says they, they knocked Jesus over as they rushed to minister to the man and deal with his needs. And that just didn't make it into the translations that we have now. But no, that's not what it says, okay? It says that they ask him, and I always wonder, I mean, what I wonder is, I wonder if they whispered it or I wondered if they said it out loud. I have a feeling they probably said it out loud. Because if you say it, what you're really saying is, why am I so much better than he is? Rabbi, who sinned with this man, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? I mean, that's a comforting statement, isn't it? I mean, that, but let me just say something. Remember back to Ed's data, 48%. Bible study alone will take care of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Is there anything, is that not, you're spiritually weak. You've got sin in your life. We need to fix you spiritually and your, your problems are going to go away. Why is he blind? Did he, he sin or his parents, that he would be born blind. And that's the other thing you got to realize. The guy was born blind, so they think his parents might have done something. In the Talmud, which is, is a kind of a compendium of Jewish thought on the Torah and things like that, it actually says that a, a pregnant woman that buys, bows to an idol, that the fetus also bows. And so that fetus is culpable for the sins of, of the mother idol. So they actually had kind of sins that an unborn child could be culpable for, and that's the thought here. What did he do? Why is he being punished, okay? So, and then Jesus, in the classic Jesus way, in a single statement, completely destroys their theology. Now, we don't have any follow-up on what the disciples thought because they disappear from the story here. This is actually quite a long story. It goes on for 41 verses, okay? There's a lot of people that show up in this story, and I think we miss it. We missed most of the story because we think it's all about him getting healed. And the healing is actually, the, is really honestly the trivial part of the overall thing. He says, it was neither that his, this man sinned or his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in his life, okay? And then he heals him. This is the guy that he spits on the ground and he sticks the clay in his eyes kind of thing. You ever wonder why he did that? You ever wonder why? Jesus spit on a lot of people. He did. He like spit on his finger and he like stuck it in a guy's ear. And you ever wonder why he did that? Because, in, again, in the Talmud, it says the spittle of a firstborn child has healing properties. He was just using a, a medicine of the dead, okay? Now, it wasn't, the it wasn't a spit that healed people. It was him. But he's just using a physical remedy of the day. Just like if, you know, my kids go get, I mean, the reality is God is the healer, right? If my kids get strep throat and they take antibiotics and they get better, God healed them. God provided that medication. That's the provision of God. We need to get away from the supernatural, natural thing. There is no supernatural. There's only what there is, and God made it. And it says God created all things. He sustains all things. So if you get better, that was God. If there's good in your life, that's God. I mean, that, that's how we got to look at it here. So he heals this man. And then the story goes on for quite a while. His parents show up. The people around him argue that he really isn't the guy that was blind. So they miss it. So let's think about the works of God. We, as modern Christians, we go, oh, the works of God were the healing. But this is the part of the scripture where Jesus is saying, I'm the light of the world. And what a better way to demonstrate the light of the world than to open a man's eyes, okay? And so the people around this guy argue that he's not even the guy that was blind. So they missed it. They miss the works of God. 
Jesus is revealing himself through what he's doing in this man's life. Then the Pharisees come along. They go, oh, who healed you on the Sabbath? That's a bad thing. They, they completely humiliate this guy in public. His parents show up. His parents won't even receive him. They're so shamed by the stigma associated with we have a, a, a grown male son who's been blind his whole life. We're cursed. They won't even, they won't even admit that it's their son. Okay, because they're so afraid of the Pharisees and of the shame and stigma associated with that. They missed it. The Pharisees missed it. They're missing the works of God being displayed. And this guy says, I don't know who it was that healed me. Because remember, Jesus never revealed himself to the guy before. He just, and the guy was blind. Jesus left before the guy could see. Because remember, he told him to go wash and then he could see. He goes, I don't know who healed me, but I know I was blind and I'm not anymore. So what does it matter? And so then Jesus hears about what happened to him. And he goes and finds him, and he says, do you know who the Son of Man is? And he says, no, tell me so I can worship him. And he worships Jesus publicly. He doesn't care anymore because now he sees the light. You see what I'm saying? The healing was only the first little tiny part. It's never mentioned again. It's, it's his, ultimately, the climax of the story is his acceptance and understanding of who Jesus is. That's the works of God. But when the works of God were displayed in his life, it wasn't just for him. It was for everyone he had come in contact with. And that's how we need to start thinking about those people that are coming in this back door that have mental health problems because God's sending them to us so that the works of God might be displayed in their life. And in another set of scriptures, Jesus gives a story about the least of these. And he says, I was sick and you looked after me. Dan just wonderfully in 45 minutes showed us, this is a sickness. If someone in your church, I mean, I know you, a lot of you people go to church, obviously. We're in a church. Someone says, I got cancer. What's your first thought? What's your first feeling? Oh, it's terrible. What can I do? Now, do you try to fix their cancer? Do you, like, go home and go mix up some cayenne pepper and a little of this? And, like, my mom always said this would cure, you know, glioblastoma. No. You go, can I bring you a meal? Can I mow your grass? Can I help you get to an appointment? Right? That's burden bearing, okay? Can I take your kids out so you can have some alone time? But what happens if we say, well, I've got depression. Hey, you know what, I, my friend had depression. We did this study of Leviticus, and man, I mean, knock that thing right out. <laughs> now, it's funny, but it's funny because I've actually seen that happen, okay? Or you just need to, you know what, you just need to read through Lamentations. Yeah, that'll really lift you up, okay? Okay, or, you know, look at Job. Yeah, let's look at Job. What did Job do? He, didn't, he did nothing but be called by God the most righteous man in all the East. And then be told after he contemplated suicide, after he begged God to listen to him, God wouldn't, wasn't speaking to him, God then said he never sinned by anything he said. We kind of miss all that. So you looked after me when I was sick. And then he says, when you did it for them, you did it for me. So let's look back at that other verse in John 9 where he says, you know, you, the works of God. So when we are serving those that are in distress, these people that God is sending to us, okay, we have an opportunity to be transformed. We're not here just for them. They're coming here for us. And if we look at it as that one way, oh, well, thank goodness you came because I can really help you, we miss it. We're the disciples. We miss the works of God. And we miss an opportunity to literally be in the presence of Jesus himself. Because as we see them transformed by our comfort and care and our show of the love of Christ to them, we are changed by seeing him in them. And that's what he's talking about in this. I was a prisoner, and you visited me. I was naked, and you clothed me. You didn't get him out of prison. You just went and visited him. You didn't cure his sickness. You just, you took care of him. You're the good Samaritan. I mean, that's what God is calling us to do. But unfortunately, for some reason, and I'm not sure why, in the 1950s to 1960s, the golden age, as we like to say, we all walked away from mental health care. We started this 
we started to get this spiritual kind of arrogance that this is all spiritual and we, you know, we can fix it. Because I want to give you some historical kind of touch points in the church that really will just blow your mind that people did this. But this was all before there were treatments, okay? This is the church of Difna, of St. Difna. It's in Gel, Belgium, okay? You might know who St. My Catholic brothers and sisters know who St. Difna is. She is the patron saint of the mentally ill. Did you even know there was a patron saint of the mentally ill? Difna, okay? Starting in the 14th century, this church was built there in a shrine. She was supposedly killed there, and her, at least some of her relics and perhaps her body are entombed there in this shrine. Starting in the 14th century, that was a long time ago, by the way, very long time ago, there were no treatments for mental illness in the 14th century. People started to bring mentally ill individuals to Gale, Belgium, so that they might be close to Difna's relics and things like that, and that there might be an opportunity that they would be healed, okay? Now, it's the 14th century, okay? Do you think you want mentally ill people around, it, around your house? I mean, it's the 21st century and people don't, okay? So it's the 14th century, you have absolutely no treatment, you have absolutely no modern conveniences, and you have a, a schizophrenic brother-in-law or something. So you take them to Gale, Belgium, and you leave them here. That's what they started to do. They thought, hey, this, we're better to leave them here with the priest. And that's what they did. And then the priest there at the Church of Difna, they tried to take care of them the best they could, just comforting them, making sure they're healthy and being taken care of. But after a while, they were overwhelmed by the number of people that were showing up. So they built a small hospital associated with the church and then tried to, you know, kind of have them there. And then they were overwhelmed there. So the people of Gell, Belgium, which is a small village, they stepped up and they said, you know what? We'll take care of them. So they started to take people into their homes. And this continued on into the modern era. I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people would be brought there, they would be taken into private homes and just cared for them. There were no treatments. They just cared for them. They took care of them because they saw them as people that were seeking healing and care from God, and they wanted to provide that. If people could do that in the 14th century, I would think we could do something today. Okay, that's the 14th century. Go Catholics. Okay, there you go. All right, Quakers. Got the friends. Are they in, uh, are they in the house? Quakers call themselves friends, if you didn't know that. So. First psychiatric hospital in America, Pennsylvania, Quakers. Quakers were tired of the way the mentally ill were being treated. Basically, they were being put into prisons, these asylums, and just housed, okay? Chained to walls, things like that, okay? They built a psychiatric, these people should be cared for. They are the children of God, just like we are. First psychiatric hospital on the top there, public hospital. First private psychiatric hospital, what's now today called the Friends Hospital. It actually still runs, it's still running, okay? It's the one here on the bottom. Any number of incredible Quaker reformers. William Took, wasn't even a, it wasn't even a doctor. Just this guy that had a family friend that died in an asylum, not from her illness, because she was neglected. She basically starved to death and died from exposure because no one was taking care of her. And he just said, you know, that should never happen, ever. And so as a, as a person of faith, he started what's called the York Retreat, which was a a place where the mentally ill could be taken care of. This is what in those days we refer to as moral therapy, or just, and it sounds like it's like, you know, righteous, but really what it meant is humane therapy, caring for someone. There's no treatment really at this point. There's just care. So again, an incredible history in the church of people stepping up and saying, these are suffering individuals and we should care for them. We should bear their burdens. Okay, now, now this is not exactly mental illness. This is a mental health problem. This is a, the original uh, Bethesda community. I was brought up uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran. So this is, I gotta give my props to the Missouri Synod Lutherans on this one. So Bethesda communities, they still exist today. Great website, if you wanna go there, check it out. It's for people that are mentally, or what we call intellectually disabled today. We used to call them mentally retarded. And in those days, actually, if you could see across the bottom, it says home for the feeble-minded and epileptic. So it was, you know, they really had these terrible terms, but but they, there was a time 
where we, people would say, people that are, at that time, they would call idiots or feeble-minded, but we call intellectually disabled. They, they, would, they said, there's no reason to share the gospel with them. They can't understand that. So those people were, you know, they were stigmatized and cast out. These Bethesda communities were started and said, you know what? These people need to know the gospel because God put them here. God loves them. God cares for them. They still exist today. They're incredible communities of mentally retarded individuals that are cared for. And the gospel is shared with them. They are transformed by the gospel and by knowing Jesus Christ. Those still exist. But again, Lutheran stepped up and said, these people should not be treated like animals. They have to be taken care of. God has put them in our lives. Okay, so that, this is, these started uh, 19th century. Uh, William Tooks, the Quakers, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's 18th century. I told you, 14th century with the, uh, with the uh, uh, chapel of uh, Difna. And so, you know, you just have this just kind of incredible history. And then the 50s got here. I mean, really, the Difna stuff really went all the way up, okay? And then the 50s get here and we get psychiatric medications in the late 50s. And then going into the 60s, we get Thomas Jazz and some of these other kind of arguments. And the church just walked away. I can't really find these kind of almost epic examples uh, after that period of time. I mean, there are certainly examples, but the church has walked away. I think in some sense what we said is, that's a medical problem, we can't really deal with that. I think also they said, oh, well, you know, psychology and psychiatry, they're no friends of the faith. I mean, Freud thought religion was a neurosis. It was its own illness. You know, and so, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get alongside that type of thing. And by the way, you know, most of what he said, nobody, that, that was just the beginning. You know, that's like saying, like, you know, when we do astrology today, we, we look at Galileo's writings. I mean, you, you, that, you gotta, we don't do that anymore. So I'm not like a little Sigmund Freud, you know, walking around. So we gotta get beyond that, okay? So what should we do? We have this great history, and then we had this kind of apathy, and then what we had is this, starting in the 70s, we have this kind of spiritual kind of ugliness that starts where this, you know, we have this movement that begins where we start to over-spiritualize everything and we get what we have today, where we have a large percentage in the church that over-spiritualize these things. And I'm not gonna say they don't have a spiritual component, they absolutely do. Because mental health issues affect you at every level. They affect you, I gotta check the time because I'm gonna get in trouble right over there. <laughs> and mental health issues affect you at every level. Two minutes? You ever say two minutes to a, psycho to a psychology professor, you know what that gets, that's 20 minutes, okay? So, <laughs> So the, I'll put a zero on the other side. The, so the thing is, is that we, we have to understand that that's not going to help anybody, and that's not what God's doing. God is not sending them to us so that we can say, oh, you're a sinner. Okay? We're all sinners. God's sending it to us so that we might see the works of God manifest in their life, and so we might have a greater intimacy with him. That's for us and for them. Okay? So what do we do? What's the church's role? Sum it all up. Okay? Three things. They all start with R. Very easy. Relieve suffering. That's what Jesus does. He relieves the suffering of the man born blind. Now well, you might say, well, look, guy, I can't, I can't help people have psychiatric illness. But back to the original example, you can't help anybody with cancer either with your cancer, unless you're an oncologist, but you do, okay? You can mow the grass. You can take a meal. You can be there to listen. You can go over and pray with them. You know, you can comfort and care for them, okay? You can relieve their suffering. That's what Jesus does first in that story. Then out of that relationship, you have an opportunity to reveal Christ. You can see them transform spiritually. You can see them hope build in their life. Hope isn't a feeling. It's a person. That's what we have to give to the mentally ill. I, there are days I don't feel very hopeful, but I have a hope that transcends my circumstances. So you can reveal Christ out of that relationship. That's what he does in that story. It's later that he's able, he reveals who he is. And then finally, you get an opportunity to walk along, to bear their burden, and to see God restore their life through the love and care that you're giving them and through his involvement in their life. Relieve suffering, reveal Christ, restore lives. That's what we're supposed to do for those people that God is sending to us. That's what we're supposed to do for anybody that's suffering. We have to not try to fix them. We just have to care for them and love them, and God will do the fixing. Thanks a lot.